when you ask for help to the universe, the universe really will respond to a good cause where you put your heart in it. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, I get to interview a creator that I admire. So you may have seen her videos on TikTok. She makes very cozy cooking videos on TikTok under the name Cafe Maddie. So we talk about Maddie's story growing up in Korea, to pursuing dentistry, to transitioning to content creating, and also how she started her nonprofit initiative, Cafe Maddie Cab. So Madeline Park is the founder of Cafe Maddie, a cooking vlog focused on Korean inspired recipes and host of the Cafe Maddie podcast, an emotional food podcast where she responds to your story with a dish to match your mood. It's really cute, by the way. She's also the founder of Cafe Maddie Cap, a service providing cab rides for Asian women, LGBTQ and elderly folks in New York City in response to the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes. Hello, Maddie. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle podcast. I'm so excited to have you. I'm such a fan. Hi, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I'm so yeah. excited to be here. Yes. Okay, so let's first, why don't you tell us about your story and what led you to starting Cafe Maddie? Sure. Um, wow, it's been a while now and I never thought um, this would go on for years. <laughs> I started this as a hobby because I like to vlog I've always loved making little vlogs and videos and just um, would put together like fun videos for my friends when we travel. So that's been like a lifelong hobby of mine. Um, and then one year I had to move out of New York for my residency and I found myself just like having nothing to do anymore because I was so used to being all of this, everything, so much to do. Um, so I picked up cooking as a hobby and naturally because I wasn't doing much other than cooking, I started filming my cooking and then that's where it all really started. I started making vlogs with my cooking and then I was posting, posting, posting all on my personal account. And one day my friends were like, you really need to make a separate account for this. And I think it'll do really well. But I was at the time really scared of starting from zero because I had like 600 followers on my personal account. And I was like, how am I going to build from zero to 600? Yeah. <laughs> I already have so many of my friends watching this and I don't want to start over. But when 2020 came around, it was my one of my resolutions to just set up the account and start posting so January 2020, I did that. Um, and then someone was like, you should post on TikTok because, you know, your format and everything is going to work well. So I started posting on TikTok um, in March 2020. And that's when the pandemic started. That's when the whole world closed down and everybody was staying home and starting to cook. So it was all in good timing where I was posting really easy, simple recipes that you could do at home while you didn't have a lot of ingredients at home. Um, and then it just took off from there. Yeah. One video went viral, two videos. How long went viral. were you posting on your personal account? I think I was posting for a year. Okay. Yeah. And did th those videos look like your TikTok videos were like the, the same format with like a voiceover? Um, no voiceover. It was all just cooking. Yeah. Yeah. Originally, really, I, um, I love cooking because it's like therapy for me. It's super calming for me. So I wanted to kind of convey that feeling to my friends or whoever was watching. So it was like usually really calming music with cooking sounds or like no music and just silent like ASMR cooking sounds <laughs> and they were like two three minutes long um, but I think with social media I kind of found a sweet spot of reducing it down to a minute and just adding my voiceover which 
surprisingly did really well. Yeah. So now I don't post anything without my voice in it. Yeah, because you're you're so calming. It just there's this like world you enter when you like watch a Cafe Maddie video. It's like so calm and cozy. And I think that's what a lot of people needed during the pandemic. It was not just the cooking, but like the feeling, right? And the storytelling. Um, yeah. So it's so interesting to me. I, I just think the timing is really perfect as well. Yeah, it really was. But thank mm-hmm. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and were you always just doing Korean cooking or did you decide to like focus down later on? Oh, I decided to focus on it later on. I was just cooking whatever I wanted, whatever I wanted to eat that day and just filming and posting. And then I noticed that the Korean recipes were doing the best. I think one video that went viral for the first time was like this video of a Korean comfort dish called sujebi, where I literally had a really hard time finding this in restaurants and it's it wasn't a very well-known dish. So I just made a video saying, hey, you probably haven't had this before. Like this is what it is. And it went viral. So I was really shocked. And even after that, for a while, I was still just cooking whatever I wanted and not focusing on what was doing well because I never saw this as like a business or something I wanted to grow so, so, so big. Um, But I think after some point, I really found the joy of introducing Korean food to the public and for people who've never had it before or people who are trying to reconnect with their culture just like me. So yeah, now I do mostly Korean food. Yeah, I noticed that. I I think people feel more in touch with it because you talk about like the history behind dishes. And I think that's really interesting. Um, I had a lot of fun with that too because I'm learning so much researching Yeah, I wanted to ask, like, how many of these recipes did you already know? Or do you just kind of, like, look it up as you go? I would say most of the history-related things, I look it up as I go. One, because I need to fact check and I want to convey the correct information. And two, I'm curious myself. I was like, oh, this is, like, something that's been on the backdrop of my um, dining table for the longest time. But I don't know the story behind it. Um, like the miyokup. This is the seaweed soup that Koreans eat on their birthday. And I was like, why do we eat this on their on our birthdays? Yeah. <laughs> and I asked my mom and she was like, I don't know. <laughs> so once I researched and confirmed the story, I told it to my mom. She was like, wow, I had no idea. <laughs> and what about so, the recipes? I'm, oh, oh, go ahead. What were you going to yeah. say? Uh, no. So it's just been a fun process for me as well. Yeah. Um, I'm also curious about the recipes. Like, are those like stuff that you've learned from your family or do you just also like Google and figure it out on your, on your own? Oh, no. Um, my mom, she's always been kind of like a eyeballer when it came to cooking. So I never really had like a written recipe from her. So I'll get the ideas from my childhood and everything that I grew up eating, but I'll always like research and look up maybe five, 10 recipes and then find a sweet spot for the portion that I want, which is like one portion for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cute. Um, I, I want to know more about how you grew up because I think that's a big part of your story too. I don't think you told the audience that you were a dentist, <laughs> right? Let's talk no. about that journey, right? From dentistry, yeah. like growing up Korean, dentistry, and then being a content creator. <laughs> sure. Um, I was born and raised in Korea. And then um, my dad was a Spanish major in college. So he got sent to Spain for a little bit. So part of my childhood, I spent in Spain with my family. Um, And then we came back to Korea. And that's in Spain is where I picked up English. Funny enough, because they sent me to like American nursery and kindergarten. So English and Korean is my first language. I learned both of them at the same time. And um, that's how I guess... When I came to the States much, much later on when I was 13, I was still fluent in English and able to kind of land here and communicate pretty well. 
Um, so yeah, I came to the States when I was 13. Never imagined myself immigrating to another country. Always thought I would always be in Korea forever my whole life. But my sister wanted to study here. And my dad's job kind of worked out um, where he was sent here as an expat. So we came here all together. And that's when my American life kind of started. So we came to New Jersey and, and I went to high school there. And I came to college and grad school in New York for dental school. Um, and then why I got to dentistry is because... I mean, did you always want to be a dentist or was it just... Yeah, I want to know that story. Um, no, I always tell people that I somehow ended up a dentist, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is an understatement because dental school was so hard. I would never ever repeat that or do that again if someone told me to. Um, but basically what happened was by the time I was graduating high school, um, I applied to a bunch of accelerated programs. So I don't know if a lot of people know, but there's a lot of accelerated medical and dental programs where you can be on a track for eight years or seven years. You don't have to take the MCAT. You don't have to take the DAT, mm -hmm. which is the dental. Um, I mean, it depends on the program. Some programs mm -hmm. will let you not. But anyways, you're put on this track as an 18-year-old to become a dentist by the time you're in, done with the program. So I got into the program for NYU, um, but I, that was the only dental program that I, uh, applied to because I was interested in the medical field. So I applied to a bunch of medical programs, um, didn't get into any of them. And I got into this one dental program. So my mom and I were like, um, okay, what do we do now? And so I started working at a dental office just to see what it was like. Um, and it wasn't anything like very, uh, it wasn't something that like stirred my passion or anything. I just kind of got to see what it was like. Um, and my mom in the end kind of sat me down and we had this immigrant talk of <laughs> like, listen, you're a first generation immigrant. Um, and it would be nice if we had something stable in the company. Mm. I mean, not the company. <laughs> She sat me down and she said, it would be nice if we had something stable in the family, like a stable profession. This is great opportunity. Yeah. And you mentioned and you have a sister. Are you the older child? No, my sister is oh, older. Your sister is older. Yeah. So was she working at the time yet or not working? Actually, at the time she was in nursing school. Oh, okay. So she was this role model for me. And that's why I applied to a bunch of medical programs because this is like the only field that I was exposed to. So I was supposed to kind of follow her footsteps. So um, in the end, I said, okay, I'll do this program. <laughs> I mean, did you have any other dreams at that time or were you just kind of like, I have no option, so I'm going to just do this? I was so clueless about what I wanted, who I was, and I basically didn't really have like an identity formed yet. So... I was really intimidated by the idea of going to a liberal arts school um, and being like, I'm going to pave my way. I'm going to be like a pioneer in my own life and like try all these classes and find out what I like. I was really scared of that. So it was kind of a psychological comfort to know that, oh, the next eight years of my life is pretty set and mm -hmm. I just need to follow a path. Um, so I went into it thinking, oh, if I don't like it, I'll just change my major but the thing about dentistry is that you don't know what it's like until you are actually a dentist treating patients. Um, um, and that's eight years later. That is such a long yeah. time. <laughs> that was actually, yeah, second year of my dental school when okay. we started clinicals. I was really yeah. shocked because, oh my gosh, this is something that I ever imagined. <laughs> you don't know what it's like to be put in a place where you're actually starting to treat real oh, people yeah. until you're there. No, like no matter how much you shadow or like maybe having a dentist in the family would be helpful. But 
anyways, I got really lucky because dentistry was the right field for me and for my personality. I'm very individualistic um, and independent and introverted, um, but also I'm very social. So interacting with like one person at a time um, and not working with a huge team and like collaboration of something was really good for me. Um, dentistry is very like, um, you get kind of an instant gratification from solving a problem immediately. You're not working on like projects that take months and months and months and you're done and you're wrap up with a team. You patient comes with a problem, you solve the problem for them and they go home happy or Mm -hmm. not. But (laughs) yeah, but it's fast. Yeah, it's fast. So it was a good match for my personality. Um, so I stuck with it. Uh, I went to residency and started practicing. So that was my, or that is still my dentist journey because yeah. I'm working part time. Yeah. Let's continue that journey. Cause I saw that you posted, you recently quit your dentist job. So what went into that decision? So that was a very, very important turning point in my life. I think, Um, Not just the quitting aspect, not just stepping into different career paths, but like I said, um, when I was 18, my mom sat me down, kind of told me, oh, let's take a stable path. And then I consciously chose a path that was set out for me. And for seven, eight years or nine years, including my residency, I was literally just taking the next step that was set out for me. Then it was so clear. You take one exam, take a midterm and a final, get good grades and pass the exam, pass the boards, go into residency, complete your residency and you're a dentist. Um, And there was nothing to question about it. And there involves no decision making on my end to some extent. Um, And then um, once I tasted this creative career of doing something so original um, that I love doing so much and people were responding really positively with something that I created. And then later on came the income and the money that I could make with this creative work. Once I tasted that, my life was never the same. Like the way I felt going to work as a dentist was a 180. Wow. Um, So I actually got laid off from my job during the pandemic. And then this whole social media thing happened. I became a different person, but I didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. So when my job called me back, I was, my brain was like, oh, this is a job that I loved. Of course, I'm going to go back. So I took the job, went back to work, nine to five, Monday to Friday. I was miserable. And I couldn't believe how miserable I was <laughs> compared to how happy I was before, you know. Um, so um, it took me a couple of months at that job for me to realize, you know what, I've been given a really good opportunity to kind of explore and grow something else of my own. Um, and it kind of took like a psychological reframing in my head um, to be able to say, okay, I'm going to take a step towards this unknown freelance life where I set my hours, I set my vacation. um, Nobody's telling me what to do, how to do it. Um, I take full control of my future. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah. I wrestled with it for a couple of weeks and then finally decided to quit. Of course, my um, Asian brain was like, I need something stable still. So I secured a part-time job just for like sanity. And here I am. Um, I think that's awesome. I'm so happy for you to have that shift in your life I think it's because maybe you didn't have like another option but once you tasted like something creative and the fact that you're so good at it and there you're getting like good feedback I think that it's amazing that you found that 
Yeah, I feel incredibly lucky. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like, would you give different advice to your younger self or would you have done anything differently knowing what you know now? Um, let's see. Yeah, I really wish this happened earlier in my life <laughs> <laughs> rather than, um, yeah, I guess I could uh, be greedy and wish that, although I'm incredibly grateful now. But I think if I were to just tell my younger self, I keep thinking about this a lot, especially recently. I worried so much mm -hmm. uh, when I was younger. I would just tell her, stop worrying. Everything's going to be fine. Your life is not going to be over. Even if you made a mistake, even if you made the wrong decision, there's always room to go back and fix it. So that's what I would tell myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I would tell the same thing to myself too. I think when you're young, you just want everything to go right and you want to make the right decision and everything feels like a big decision, right? Like everything's, yeah. so, I don't know, there's a lot of anxiety if you, if you care about, I don't know, living life well. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's the Asian upbringing as well <laughs> that yeah, plays into totally that. Totally true. Totally mm -hmm. true. Before we go on, I want to take a break to share about today's sponsor, Audible. I've been using Audible for many years. I love audiobooks because it's a fun and effortless way to learn while getting something else done. I'll listen to Audible on my walks, while driving, or doing chores. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to mysteries, thrillers, wellness, business, and more. I personally like listening to celebrity memoirs because it's like listening to them tell their story directly to you. A couple of my favorites are Born a Crime by Trevor Noah and Over the Top by Jonathan Van Ness. Though they're known for audiobooks, Audible also has podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, comedy, and originals. Consider Audible your destination for self-growth and wellness, whether you're looking to soul search, be inspired, work towards new goals, unwind, or simply be entertained. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Just visit audible.com slash TLL or text TLL to 500-500. Again, that's audible.com slash TLL or text TLL to 500-500. Okay, so going back to your cooking and your content, I, I, I love your content. I already told you that, but I have to say it again. I'm just curious, like, where you get your inspiration for, like, you know, do you have a process on what you decide to share? Um, let's see. My inspiration comes from uh, unique ingredients. When I see an ingredient that's intriguing, um, I've never seen before, I'll always kind of look up recipes um, and try to play around with it. That would be kind of my personal project, maybe not like a Korean cooking. Um, so that's a big inspiration for me. And then another one is Korean history. And anything that kind of reels me back to my roots and culture is an inspiration because not uh, until recently that I realized, oh my gosh, I always sort of identify myself as a Korean person in Korea, even if I was spending so much time in the States. I think a couple years ago, um, I hit a point where it kind of split in half oh, I said, oh my gosh, it's been like half of my life I've been in Korea and now the other half has happened in America and I'm standing in this sort of like a midpoint and at a certain point I realized, oh my gosh, I'm only going to become more American from here on and that Korean part of me will become smaller and smaller because I can't really control how much I spent there, you yeah. know? Yeah. So that's when it hit me. Oh, I really want to consciously try to hold on to stories and mm -hmm. memories yeah. that are important to me. And food definitely became such a strong bridge for me to explore that. Wow. I think that's, I, I can feel that in your work because, like, there's so much emotion related to like the stories and the memories that you share. Um, 
yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that because food is related to our memories of our childhood and things like that. Yeah. And no better place to tell the story than America where we're a melting pot and it's such a strong immigrant culture. Um, and we have all this nostalgia that a lot of people after some generations are starting to lose touch with. I think what's special about you and a lot of Korean American probably love your content is because you spent a good amount of your childhood in Korea. Like, cause some people who were maybe born here, they're not as connected to the food. That's why I was surprised. I was like, how does she know all this food, all these recipes? Like, I thought you were actually born in America. Um, yeah, but it makes sense that you, yeah, you actually were, lived there for a while. So you're more connected and like people who want to feel more connected will like watch your content because you have an extra level of like experience and knowledge. I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm also thinking about like the story of your grandpa that you recently shared, which I thought <laughs> was super sweet. Can you share that with our audience? Yeah. Um, so my grandpa is such a role model for me. And looking back at his tendencies and his life, I don't know all the details of his life, but he's always been very tech savvy and forward thinking. He's had this blog that he posts like every week, um, very passionate about Korean history. So he'll write about all these Korean historical figures, visit all these historical sites. He'll put together photos and like the text and the research and like the sources. And he's 95, right? Yeah. And he's been doing it for years and years and years of uh, more than I can remember. I always remember him at his computer when I was visiting him as a kid too. So he's a content creator. Like he's yeah. been doing this he's for a long OG time. Content yeah. creator around in our family. It's in your genes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's wow. definitely trickled down to me. Um, and what's funny is that when I started posting on YouTube, um, he started watching my stuff on YouTube, um, and he figured out the whole YouTube thing and I realized that I started seeing his comments on every single one of my videos that I was posting um and he started we so because of that we started texting more and he'll update me on his life with like photos and messages um and recently I just kind of started feeling particularly really sad about um not having seen him for so long and him so actively trying to get in touch with me. And every time I put myself in his shoes where I imagine myself as a 95 year old person trying to reconnect with <laughs> his like, or her think, like yeah, granddaughter. I know. I'm just like, so precious. Yeah. It just blows my mind. And the, um, I think one night I just like burst out into tears because he said something like, oh, thank you for t texting me. Or, or, and then he was like, we went on a walk here today. I wish we could go on a walk together. And I just like came home and I started bawling. So I think that was like a point where I was like, oh, shoot, I need to, I want to talk to him more. And I feel bad that he's watching all my videos in English and has no idea what I'm saying. Um, so the video that I posted about quitting my job, a majority of it is me being miserable at my old job. But his comment was like, hey, your day in your life looks pretty fun. Because <laughs> he didn't understand a <laughs> so word good. of it. Yeah. Which I'm glad he didn't because yeah. I don't uh, want him to think I'm miserable here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's always been on my mind for a while to kind of post more in Korean. Um, so that's, that's what I did recently. I posted a vlog of me speaking in Korean and I was talking to him as if I was kind of like updating my thoughts and my daily routine to him. And he really loved it. He was mm -hmm. so happy. Yeah. 
I think that's so sweet. The fact that you have that relationship and the fact that you're able to like share it in such a honest way is like, I think that's, I don't know. It's so special. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I really couldn't imagine like how it would be received. I was like, who wants to watch a Korean video? <laughs> I think understand. everybody can relate to just that. I don't know. There's so many like feelings there related to like grandparents, family, or like not being able to see each other for so long or language barrier, right? There's so many levels of relatability there that I just thought that was so so nice for you, you to share. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, another like compliment I have to give you is you're really great at storytelling. I don't know if it just comes natural to you or you plan it out, like the way you structure your videos, right? So my question is like, how much of that, the, I guess, storytelling do you plan out or is it just you being yourself? <laughs> so every video that I make is always scripted. I tried kind of doing it spontaneously, but I was taking too many takes and I was wasting so much time. So I started writing everything out. Um, and I guess that's kind of like a storytelling process where I start writing the story. Um, and I know like how long a paragraph will be one minute. So once I write that, I'll see if it corresponds with the video and then tweak some things and rearrange some sentences and words to kind of match the video so do you have the video done first and then you like script it after yeah usually yeah yeah but um yeah storytelling's been really fun for me and I don't think I'm like very very good at it but I would love to this has been like really good practice for me to get better and better at it yeah because I also watched like your Cafe Maddie podcast episodes where you like cook while telling your own story and I think that's really cute too thank you thanks for watching my podcast (laughs) I know it's really good you guys you should check out her podcast it's on YouTube (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay. So let's talk about another project that you started, I think, last year, Cafe Maddie Cab. Um, I think it's amazing. I'm like so proud of you for starting this. Can you share with our audience what it is and why you started it? Sure. Um, Cafe Maddie Cab is a nonprofit organization that sends out taxi rides for the Asian population who are at risk of um, Asian hate crimes in New York. So we're sending out cab rides to Asian elderly people, Asian women or LGBTQ people um, so that when they know they're going to go on a ride uh, where it's a risky hour or area, we send out Uber codes so that they can use it for um, their safety. So um, I did not imagine that it would become an organization by now because last year when I started it, it was kind of at the height of all the headlines that we were seeing. Um, And like everybody else, I was getting so fed up, so angry, um, so incredibly sad about this reality Um, And my 15 years in the U.S. since immigrating here, I have never, ever felt like being Asian was a disadvantage. I was never ashamed. I was always so proud to be Korean and Asian. Um, So the fact that this world was putting this burden on me where I could be attacked because of the way I look... um, And my mom could be attacked because of the way she looks. My dad could be attacked. I was really feeling a lot of anger. So if anyone really asked, honestly, I started from a place of incredible fury in my heart Mm -hmm. (laughs) at the time. Yeah. Um, And I said, I'm so fed up. If anyone needs a ride, here it is. Um, So that's how I started. I just put aside $2,000 at the time. And I knew that a bunch of my followers on Instagram were living in New York and they're also female. So initially I offered, if you're a woman and you need a ride and you feel like you're not safe and you can't afford to take a cab, just Venmo request me and I'll just send out rides as long as 
the two thousand dollars run out. Um, and uh, I did that, and I wanted more people to see it and use the rides. So I set up another Instagram account, and I asked all my friends to tag Asian celebrities mm -hmm. that might be able to kind of amplify the story. And it was just kind of cold shot. Um, and then I went to sleep. And the next day, the next thing I realized, this post has gone, had gone viral. Um, the celebrities that we tagged indeed did repost us. Um, and the next thing I know, people wanted to donate. They were like, we want to donate to this fund. And in my head, I said, yeah, a couple more bucks like means more rides. Just, you know, I'm sending rides out of my Venmo account. So just Venmo me <laughs> <laughs> to the same account. So, yeah. and then I'll just have the funds come and go through it. And then the next morning, uh, the next thing I know, I had $100,000 wow. in the Venmo account. Um, so that's when I realized, ooh, this kind of blew up to a scale that I never imagined. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I really kind of got down to business and started to build a team, mm. started to recruit volunteers and build an operation that worked wow. for the city. That's amazing. And I know since then you've like got so many partnerships and people are continuing to donate. So, and it's funny how this was not planned or expected <laughs> at all. I mean, how did you feel like having to assemble a team? Like how, you know, doing all of that, making it an a organization? Yeah. So first of all, I had zero experience building anything like that. I have zero experience in the nonprofit world, never been involved in a charity, only started donating to small organizations or here prior during COVID. Um, and like I said, I'm a dentist, so I don't work with a team. I work with myself and I'm just not a natural team player. So it was really, really challenging for me to um, kind of start to start swimming. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy to do area. what you did. Um, so when it was really apparent that I needed more help, um, thankfully, because we got so much media coverage so quickly, when I asked for help, we got the exact help we needed immediately. So it really took a village of really talented people donating their talent and doing pro bono work for us. Um, so it was from designers who are on call who made assets for me whenever I needed it to accountants that I reached out through TikTok or um, like nonprofit consultants who did pro bono work and all of our volunteers. And then a tech company who kind of really came in for us and did free admin work at no cost for months and months and months. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I kind of, that all happened, not because I planned X, Y, Z, but I was just kind of rolling with the punches and putting out fires as I was going. Um, and I think there was definitely a specific moment in time where I had to make a decision whether I was going to move forward or not because um, I think I was holding off media interviews for the longest time because I was so scared that um, it would scale up to the point where I couldn't handle it and I was scared of failure I was scared that I'll have to tell people oh you know we're going to refund everybody <laughs> because I can't do this anymore um, but I still remember I was kind of like in my room here. Um, and I, I, once I made the conscious decision of like, okay, I'm just going to take a leap of faith and then see if it works out or not. Um, and once I made that decision to move forward and just deal with everything on the way, it was so much easier so the point of hesitation was like the most excruciating. And then mm. once I put my head down and started working, it, it really just kind of took off on its yeah. own. Yeah. I think it's amazing to see like all these volunteers come in and be a part of this. I think because the cause is so great, like a lot of people do believe in it and support it, but 
yeah, I, I, I think everyone was there to support you so that it, it made it work because everybody wanted to make it work, right? Yeah. Without mm-hmm. every single person who was involved, I would, don't think we would have survived. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about now? Where is the project now? Like, is there an end goal or are you just continuing it? So we ran for four months last year and closed out. I was, even with all the help that we got, so incredibly burnt out. And I told myself I would never do this again. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was on an interview once and then someone said, oh, once you're in the nonprofit world, you can never go back. And then I remember thinking, not me. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna do this. Like, I want to make food videos again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm so burnt out. Blah blah blah. Yeah. And um, but unfortunately, there uh, was so much crime happening this early this year, and there were terrible, terrible things happening in New York. Uh, murders, just so so heartbreaking so the question kind of was lingering in my head um so I started slowly making contact with the teams all my volunteers also were burnt out so (laughs) nobody really responded um and they had moved out of the city and like life events happened so we're all scattered now Um, And the tech company, that was a huge help to us. They had closed down and moved on to another startup. So I just kind of was left without much until my co-leader now, Leah Yu. uh, You might know her, right? Mm -hmm, Um, Yeah. She's CEO of Crave Beauty, and she's also a YouTuber. Um, She got dinner with me one day, and I was complaining to her how burnt out I was. And she texted me later that day asking if I could help you with all of the things that stressed you out this year, um, would you do it? And I had just gotten off with, um, just gotten off from a call with Uber when she texted me, um, who were more than willing to donate again this year. So it kind of, everything came in really good timing. So Leah stepped in as a co-leader And she's been amazing, just kind of spearheading, recruiting the right people who are actual professionals at their job, doing what they do now in the nonprofit. So we have operation managers and tech people, web developers, designers, kind of working together so efficiently. So she interviewed people, uh, onboarded. um, So we're working together to run this and it's been amazing (laughs) so we relaunched maybe three weeks ago and then we've been able to send out rides every week for and this is our fourth week now wow that's amazing it's leah is so talented and she's so skilled (laughs) so she is so efficient yeah (laughs) true boss is the right word (laughs) yeah i think that's amazing that you two work together so well like that um yeah So do you have any advice to anyone listening who maybe has like hopes to start nonprofit initiatives like this? My advice has always been don't try to perfect everything before you launch and start something. You don't have to have your head wrapped around every single detail and feel like you're finally ready in order to kind of put something out in the world. If you have an idea, of course, you're not going to just start with one idea, but at least put it out in the world where more people can see. Post about it in your personal Instagram. That's what I did in the first place. I said, is this a crazy idea to my friends? And one person responded, no, (laughs) sounds like a good idea. (laughs) (laughs) That was enough. Yeah, that was enough for me to be like, okay, I'm going to do it. Um, But... Yeah, don't be afraid because um, you don't, one, you don't have experience and two, um, you don't have everything ready because Mm -hmm. when you ask for help to the universe, the universe really will respond to a good cause where you put your heart in it. Yeah, 
I love that. It's beautiful for you to share that story because I think in the times that we live in, there's so many issues, right? And a lot of young people, they care and it makes us angry or frustrated or whatever, like kind of like what you were talking about, what you were feeling. And uh, most of the time people don't know what to do and they end up not doing anything. But the fact that you actually got up and did something, even though you had no experience, you didn't it, you didn't expect it to be become so big, but you just started like Venmoing people for rides. I think that that initiative is so beautiful. And it, 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 I'm sure this will inspire people listening that no matter how small, like you can still make a difference. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you did. You're you're amazing for doing that. Okay, so now I want to hear about what's next for you. I need. I know you're working part time, but you're focusing more on creating content, right? So, what are your, I guess, future goals, future dream life, <laughs> things like that? Yeah. Um, I don't think I have like a crazy, crazy aspiration and achievement and anything uh, I do want to work on a cookbook eventually so that's probably somewhere in the future and I was exploring podcast content um, early this year I launched a podcast and it's on pause because <laughs> I've been so busy but I want to do more of that um, and see where it takes me really this is kind of how I've been living um, I focus on, really on what I love to do keep doing more of it and then it always leads me to the next thing even if I don't know what it is that's amazing um, I, I honestly think that's tr how I'm trying to live life now too. I used to be the type, I mean, I still like to plan goals and think like five, 10 years ahead, <laughs> but, but it's more about like following your joy in the current moment because life will lead you to the right things if you're following the right feeling. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And I love watching your videos when oh, I feel you. unsure about my life. <laughs> I was going to ask you, I was like, living this way, does it make you feel like uncertain? Like, is that difficult to deal with? Um, I think with the right backup plans and financial pillars, it's um, when you just think about the creative aspect, it's not scary because you're nurturing what you love to do. But if that was the only um, dependent of what's providing for your life obviously it'll be scary um some people are okay with that some people are not so i think you just gotta find what works for you mm -hmm. yeah i mean and coming from your very stable background i'm sure this is a transition period you're going through yeah for sure for sure but i'm much much happier now Good. I'm happy you're happier. Um, another thing I saw you do was like you were in Italy for a while, like living your best life, oh, <laughs> eating yes. all the good food. <laughs> yeah. That made me happy because I really wanted to travel. <laughs> like it's uh, been a while to like, yeah. How, yeah. what made that decision and how long were you out there? Um, uh, I think it was also a streak of, oh, let me take control of my life and invest in what I love to do. So my friend Tina Duby Dubab, she sent me a TikTok one day and she said, hey, this girl went on this trip to Italy and she took a cooking course. You want to do it? It's next month. <laughs> and I said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we booked it. And then next thing I know, I was on a flight to Italy. Um, but it was so worth every penny, so worth every minute that I spent there, no, nothing that I ever imagined. It wasn't much of like a culinary educational experience where I learned a crazy cooking skill and like I came back a better chef, but um, just being immersed in a group of people who are also really interested in cooking and food, uh, getting to know strangers for seven days and um, being surrounded in nature and experiencing what it's like to cook and eat from really natural ingredients, uh, really homegrown, like sustainable ingredients. Um, that was pretty life-changing for me. Yeah. But it was also really good to get out of the States yeah. for once. <laughs> <laughs> 
how has that trip like changed the way you view cooking like has it changed the way you like create your videos or anything like that um slowly but surely i think one thing that i didn't know before um but i learned in that course the chef that taught us was very very big on sustainability um and he explained and broke down the whole process of manufacturing um ingredients and how ingredients are processed and why things are expensive and why some things are cheap and um i think i've been a student for so long that i'm always in this like kind of oh i need to save money and need to get the bang for my buck kind of mentality so i didn't know that ex- buying expensive ingredients sometimes and investing in like organic um organic product or organic produce or going to the farmers market and buying their expensive products is sometimes more bang for your buck because it'll have more ingredient i mean it'll have more nutrients um that are more enriching for your body and for the environment which is a full cycle because mm-hmm. whatever is good for the environment feeds into the soil and grows good produce and then it just keeps on going like that. So that's a big lesson that I learned. So I'm more ingredient conscious. Mm. Um and it also changed the way how I choose to spend money too. Yeah. Love that. Um I guess lastly, is there anything you want to leave the audience with in terms of advice for for I guess if they want to be like a cafe mati like they want to start making cooking videos on TikTok or they want to make cozy videos things mm. like that I would say the best way to start as a content creator is to love your own content don't start out thinking or with the purpose of being loved by people or getting a lot of views or going viral i think the healthiest mentality to have is to be completely okay uh with getting like no views but happy that your art or your creation is out there um thriving <laughs> and you love it and you have to be your number one fan of your own content uh because when you are identity is yoked with something you can't control which is the response of the public or how many views you're getting then your mood and your emotion will be forever yoked with how up and down that is going forward so i think it's really really good practice early on in your content journey to do stick to what you like uh stick to your style and try different things of course like you'll be inspired by this person that person and maybe like copy and try and implement but um just keep doing it mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah is my advice keep doing it do you you say you love your own content like do you watch your videos over and over again <laughs> like oh, when yeah. you, all the time <laughs> like you're a fan of your own videos i i do that too sometimes <laughs> but i'm like oh this one's really good no one appreciates this one <laughs> <laughs> Not so much anymore because editing time is a lot yeah. and by the time I'm done editing I'm like I have watched this too many times <laughs> while I was editing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, early on loved my all of my <laughs> videos. They're all gems. <laughs> That's so cute. <laughs> um yeah, do you find that like is there a correlation between the videos that you're really really proud of and like what people resonate with or do you find that it's it's not correlated? I'm just curious. Um I think the videos that I love the most do the worst. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel too. So I was going to ask you is that similar to you, your experience? Yeah, it's like the most curious thing. I'm like, why not? This is great. <laughs> I pour my heart into yeah. it. And like so like only the people who get it will watch it. So I kind of feel a little exclusive with them and uh, whatever it works. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, there is no correlation. <laughs> I just feel like maybe it's the artist part of you that like you're really proud of this work, but it because it's so niche that mainstream people don't appreciate it. It's, it's usually maybe. like those well, I don't know. <laughs> I yeah. have that theory. Yeah. yeah. 
you can be a little experimental and then it'll it won't catch the mainstream mm-hmm. <laughs> anymore mm-hmm. <laughs> um awesome so maddie where can we find you online you can find me at cafe maddie on tiktok instagram and youtube and also on spotify or apple podcast my podcast is called the cafe maddie podcast so you can find me there as well Awesome. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure talking to you, getting to know you more. Yeah, this flew by. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to listen to this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it felt like one of your podcasts. podcasts. Like listening to your voice for so long, I just it's so like calm and, and chill. <laughs> oh, thank you. And yeah. you have a wonderful voice as well. Oh, thank you. I just need to tell you, early this year, I'm so chaotic and messy. And when I Googled how to be more organized, your video was the first thing that popped up. And it's helped me so much. Really? Okay, good. It's like half the year so far and it's helped me so much. Okay, good. (laughs) Okay, I'm happy to hear that. I... And I have to put out there, I'm not the most organized person out there. I just make these videos and, but I don't always, I'm not always like that. Like no one's perfect, right? (laughs) Yeah. But I'm glad you put your advice out there because Yeah. (laughs) yeah, you're helping so many people out there. Awesome. Well, I wish you the best. Everyone definitely check out Maddie at Cafe Maddie, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere. And definitely check out her podcast because it it just has such good cozy vibes. And she always puts some like emotional, I don't know, she always makes things beautiful. A true artist. (laughs) Oh, thank you. So sweet. 